Assalamu alaikum. My name is Akhtar Hamidi, and I'm a psychiatrist here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I graduated from Sin Medical College in 1984, and it is a matter of great honor and privilege for me to actually present on the same podium of this very same hall that I used to be sitting on those benches where you're sitting now uh, decades ago. So it is actually uh, a moment of joy for me. And I'm looking forward to share my knowledge with you so uh, you can find it some helpful. So today we are going to talk about the schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorder. Um, it's a pretty vast subject and I'll try to uh, bring as much information as I can during this limited time that we have. So just to let you know that this activity is sponsored by Genasin Medical University Alumni Association of North America. Um, the idea of this lecture is to give you an overview and synopsis of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders so you have a better understanding of various psychiatric terminology, evolution of the symptoms and progression of disease along with the diagnostic tool. So in no way it is comprehensive. Uh, so to utilize this more effectively and more efficiently, I would strongly recommend that you but go back to your textbook or the literatures and collect more information before you start practicing and taking care of the patient. The objectives are that at the end of the lecture, I'm hoping that I should be able to give you um, all you need to understand schizophrenia and associated psychotic disorders, to recognize and identify the symptoms, evaluate the patient, order appropriate tests, uh, make a differential diagnosis, and then come to a definitive diagnosis, explore various treatment modalities and be able to help the patient. So let's start with the basic definitions that we all use in psychiatry. Um, psychosis is a very common term used. If you look at the definition, um, it's very extensive and um, I really had great difficulty keeping up to it. So I came up with this basic uh, understanding of what psychosis is. So basically, loss of touch to the reality is psychosis. When the patient is unable to distinguish between reality from fantasy. So how does it manifest? It can manifest itself by one or the other way, either in the form of perception or form of thinking. Perception can be in two ways. It can be hallucinations or illusions. And thinking is by delusions. So what are the, the definition of these terms that I just used? Illusions means that there is a false perception to a false stimulus. Um, you're sitting uh, in the first row in one of the big auditorium in Las Vegas, and suddenly the curtain goes up. And right in the middle of the stage, there's Eiffel Tower. On the tip of the Eiffel Tower, there's old Chevy hanging and David Copperfield sitting on it. Um, is it really possible? No, it is not. So what is happening that there is a stimulus, but you're perceiving it different. It's illusion. If you don't believe in it, you know that it cannot happen, but you're being deceived, then you're not psychotic. You start believing into it that that is reality. I've just seen with my own eyes. Now you're crossing the line and getting into the psychotic state. Has hallucinations, on the other hand, they're false perception to a false stimulus. There is no stimulus and people start perceiving things. And that's the most common presentation in schizophrenic patients. So these two are in uh, the perceptive spectrum. Now, delusion, on the other hand, is the false fixed belief outside the patient's intelligence, social, cultural, and religious background. To give you an example, uh, in Native American culture, they believe the spirits come down and when, uh, soon after the patient dies, and then they go and do the prayers and chanting after which they're spirits get lighter because their sins are being washed out and the spirits goes back up in the heaven. 
is that humanly possible? Most people would say no. So why is that not a delusion? Because it is shared by a group of people who practice the same religion. So it has to be outside the patient's social, cultural, and religious background. So if that is a false fixed belief, which cannot be changed, it is called delusion. Now we are gonna hear a few terms uh, down the road during this lecture and again during your practice time is catatonia, catalepsy and cataplexy it can be confusing at times. Catatonia is generally misperceived that there is limited movement. It definitely is a psychogenic motor immobility with an extreme loss of motor skills. The person sits in a certain position for a long period of time and they don't move. However, it can also present with hyperactivity, which is purposeless, stereotypical, repetitive mo movement. So they are moving all around, but they're not producing any results. That can also be catatonia. Catalepsy, on the other hand, and it's a marked rigidity of the muscles, and they sit in a particular posture and they can sit there for hours. Uh, important thing to know about that is the person does not perceive the pain. So what happens in catalepsy that rather than uh, just the muscular rigidity, but there's also altered pain sensation. So that will cause um, the catalepsy. Sometimes it is also called vexit flexibility. Cataplexy has nothing to do with psychiatry. This is actually a neurological disorder. Usually happens after an abrupt uh, emotional uh, overload, usually laughing or crying. And patients lose, and it's usually transient, they lose abruptly the tone of the muscles and to the point that they fall down. They do not lose consciousness, and then they get up a short while later usually associated with narcolepsy. Now, there are two symptoms that are very particular, peculiar to the schizophrenic spectrum disorders. Positive symptoms, the symptoms that usually unaffected people do not experience and patient start experiencing, such as hearing voices that the other people don't hear, seeing things that the other people don't see. So hallucinations, delusions, and sometimes they start making their own words. And it sounds like that they're communicating in the language, but when you explore it, it does not make sense. It doesn't come from any particular language. So those are positive symptoms. Negative symptoms are those that unaffected people normally have, and the patient with the schizophrenia tend to lose those things. And it could be starting with the disturbance in thinking. They cannot think properly or they our process is very slow. Their speech can be disrupted. Either it can um, be very monotonous or explosive, uh, whispering. So there are disturbances there, as well as there is flattening of affect. It can be of various degree. Affect is the expression, motor expression or external expression of the internal emotion. So if you look at the person who is suffering, who is having the negative symptom of flattening of affect, you cannot make out from a distance that what are they actually talking about because there's no expression on the face. And that can be of different severity from constriction to blunted to, to complete flattening of affect. They also neglect the personal hygiene. Um, now, poverty of speech that they start losing their vocabulary. And we have already talked in and catalepsy, a cataplexy was the altered sensation. So these people, if you see schizophrenic in the month of July, they're wearing the trench coat and all the belongings they have, whereas they may be walking naked during the winter months when it's snowing outside. <clears throat> so how many types of hallucinations? Obviously auditory is the most common of the psychiatric illnesses. Visual hallucinations can happen, but they usually pertain more to medical conditions such as tumor and trauma to the brain. Tactile hallucinations are uh, altered sensations, are usually related to substance abuse, either intoxication, but more commonly with the 
substance withdrawal. Olfactory hallucinations is more related to epilepsy. Um, gastrotertory, again, it's very rare, but can happen. Um, also the movement, the kinesthetic and the somatic complaints can happen. Somatic complaints, actually somatic hallucinations do usually associate with the somatic delusions also. The patient believes that they have a serious illness which is actually being proven negative despite an extensive medical workup, but they continue believing and on that of it, they start having the feelings of those somatic uh, complaints or sensations that they're having. Pseudosciasis is a classic example of that. Now delusion on the other hand could be persecutory or paranoid type, jealousy type, erotomanic, which means that the person of higher power, usually of opposite gender, are intense uh, love to the person, uh, despite the evidence contrary to it. Grandiosity uh, usually happens in patients with mania, somatic, we already talked about it, bizarre, where the, the delusion does not make sense, usually happens um, in the form of schizophrenia. Now, if the person is comfortable with the delusion that they have, uh, they, it would be called mood congruent. However, if the person feels uncomfortable and distressed about whatever the beliefs that they have, then it would be mood incongruent. <clears throat> so psychosis, the causes are onto two spectrum. One is the psychiatric causes of it and the other are the medical causes. And we will be talking to most of the psychiatric causes such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, delusional disorder and other ones. However, in the medical, um, the the synonym to remember is I watched death, and you can read it the infection, withdrawals, metabolic disorders, trauma, and so on. So, this is just for the exam purposes. I threw it in so that uh, you may copy it and then try to remember it, what they are, and then you can go from there. Now, we can divide the psychotic symptoms into two categories, the schizophrenic spectrum and non-schizophrenic spectrum. So let's talk. Because um, the psychosis, as I showed in the previous slide, and their delusional disorders, substance and medication induced, they can present the similar symptoms as, uh, such as hallucinations and sometimes delusions also. Hallucinogen persisting perception disorders, uh, people that have used hallucinogens such as PCP and LSD, they can have what we call synesthesia, in which patients describe that they can hear colors and see voices. Uh, so it's, it's a very strange, uh, presentation that you really have to see the patient to believe it. Uh, psychotic disorder due to medical conditions. Catatonia can be because of the medical conditions, but it can also be associated with the schizophrenic spectrum. In the previous DSM 4 TR classification, there was a subcategory of schizophrenia called catatonic schizophrenia, but in DSM 5, they've removed it. They do not make subclassification of the schizophrenia. Um, but it can be used as a specifier. Then we have cluster A, personality disorders such as paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal, where people can show psychotic symptoms, and that is also because of their beliefs or the delusions that they have during those personality disorders that can cause uh, the psychotic symptoms. Now, to meet the criteria for the schizophrenia or the schizophrenic spectrum disorder, the previous slide that we talked about, they have to have one of these six um, symptoms and their delusion, hallucination, disorganized speech, disorganized or catatonic behavior, negative symptoms, and disorganized thoughts. 
and I will explain to you as we go further. So the first three, this is a continuum or progression of the schizophrenia. If you look at the, this slide, so it starts with brief psychotic disorder and progresses to schizophrenia form disorder to schizophrenia. So the difference is that day one, the symptom appear until day 30, it will be considered as brief psychotic disorder. The difference is that they only have to have one of the first three symptoms, which is delusion, hallucination, and disorganized speech. However, when the progress to schizophrenia form, day 31 to six months, it will be called a schizophrenia form disorder, and the symptoms must last for at least a month. And now they have to have two out of the first five criteria. And at least one of them should be one, two, or three, which is delusion, hallucinations, and the disorganized speech. <clears throat> Now, schizophrenia is six months onwards. Same thing as the schizophrenia form. Duration is longer. They still require two of the one of the five symptoms. And again, one of the first three have to be present. Now, you also start noticing that there is a decline level of functioning from the premorbid. Before they had started having the symptoms, there is a clear decline in their functioning, in their schoolwork. Um, And you start noticing those. So why do we have to have three different names for the same illness? The reason is that the brief psychotic disorder, only 50% of them will progress to become a schizophrenic. And once they become a schizophrenic form after six months, 80% will continue to become schizophrenia. However, 20% will permit and will go in complete remission and recovery. So if on day one six, for example, 100 people presented with symptoms of psychosis, which meet the criteria of brief psychosis on day one. And so day 31, there'll be only 50 people who will have it. And out of those 50, 80% will become schizophrenic. So six months later, there'll be only 40 patients. So if we started day one, we would have 100 schizophrenic, but we waited for six months. And now we have a much lesser incidence of the schizophrenia. So Brief psychotic disorder we talked about, day one to day 30, 50% progress to schizophrenia. It seems like I'm talking ahead of myself, but that's okay. Uh, I will try to get as much as possible during the time. And usually there is a depression fairly common in patients with psychosis. Um, and you have to keep a very close eye even after the symptoms have resolved to address the depression as it increases the risk of suicide. Um, Good prognostic sign for people that who have brief psychotic disorder is that they had a good functioning before the symptoms started. And there was identifiable stressors that would trigger this episode. And the first degree relatives do not have the, the history of any psychotic illness in, in, in the past. And there's sudden onset of confusion and there are affective symptoms like mood symptoms. There's depression or anxiety or disturbed sleep, disturbed appetite. If those things are associated, these people tend to recover uh, much quicker and in more, most cases, almost 100%. It is noticed that people with uh, cluster A and cluster B, uh, such as borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality and hysterionic personality disorder, they tend to have brief psychotic disorder more than those who do not have personality disorder. And there's also a family history of mood disorder and psychotic disorder. Remember we talked about if there is a family history, it is not a good prognostic sign. Um, psychodynamically, if you look, they, they use projection as the main defense mechanism. Uh, we treat them with the antipsychotic and anxiolytics, in most cases, symptoms improve uh, within a month. The schizophrenia form disorder, on the other hand, um, it, we talked, it occurs between one month to six months. Usually it's more common in adolescents, and they also tend to have more mood disorders and a family history, and 60 to 80% progress to become schizophrenic. Uh, usually, 
the episode, even those that will remit, there are recurrent episodes. And we treat them with antipsychotics, and they may also require uh, the antidepressant and mood stabilizer, depending on to the mood symptoms they're exhibiting. Now, schizophrenia. Um, Schizophrenia, on the other hand, there is a continuous persistence of the signs and symptoms beyond six months, and there is a decline in functioning, at least in one area, which is work, relationship, and self-care. Uh, the other conditions must be ruled out, such as schizoaffective disorder or psychosis that occur during depressive episode or mania in bipolar disorder. So those have to be ruled out and also you have to make sure that if it's not because of the direct physiologic effect of the substances that they may be abusing. So also if there is a history of autistic spectrum disorder or any communication disorder in childhood, so they can be diagnosed with the schizophrenia but the symptoms must last for at least a month. So these are from DSM-5. Schizoaffective disorder is usually a combination of, not usually, I mean, it's always a combination of schizophrenia and one of the mood disorders. So they have to have underlying schizophrenia and they have a full-blown either major depressive episode or a manic episode to be diagnosed as a schizoaffective disorder. Now, how do we differentiate that from person that who had a psychotic episode during just the mood episode. So that's why they have to have an uninterrupted period of the psychiatric symptoms during which there's a major episode concurrent with criteria of schizophrenia. So what happens if they have to have both symptoms of schizophrenia on one hand and symptoms of either major depressive episode or a mania at the same time. After the mood episodes have resolved, they have to have a two weeks period in between the two mood episodes where patient continues exhibiting either delusions or hallucination, which is the symptom of the schizophrenia, which means they have an underlying psychotic disorder, which was superimposed by the mood disorder. Uh, I hope it makes sense to you, and that can be, uh, and it is usually repeatedly asked in board exams and in, in also in oral exams. So it's important that you understand that depressive or manic symptoms are coming on patients who do, do meet the criteria of schizophrenia during this phase. So, So they have to have the psychotic residual symptoms and that's how we diagnose. Now, the good news is that the patients that who have a schizoaffective disorder, they have a better prognosis than people who just have purely uh, schizophrenia. To code in schizophrenia, once you have diagnosed that, you have to specify whether it is the first episode, it is part of the multiple episodes, whether it is acute, or in partial remission or full remission and vice versa. So, and also you have to specify, remember I was telling you that in the previous edition of DSM, they had different categories or sub subtypes of schizophrenia. They've removed it. Now we purely call that a schizophrenia and you can put this specifier as catatonia. The reason of removing those subclassification is that it really did not change the presentation or the diagnostic treatment or strategies. So it was just more confusing. And I think that's the reason they took that out. And now you can add the other symptoms as specifiers. Now for schizoaffective disorder, you have to specify that which kind of affective disorder do they have. The schizoaffective disorder depressed type, schizoaffective disorder bipolar type. Now you have to specify and that Depressed type, is that the first major depressive episode or that the, it is recurrent? Uh, same thing with the bipolar disorder. Is it presenting with depressive episode or it's presenting with mania or hypomania? Now, catatonia, we briefly touched it when I was uh, going through the definitions. Um, 
to based on the DSM-5, they have to meet three of the following criteria, which are super cataplexy. We talked about that vaccine flexibility, mutism, negativism, posturing. So if you see that that's motor activity and there's also the verbal part of it. And then there is physical presentation and then agitation. So mannerism, stereotypy, the, there is repetitive, same purposeless movement, agitation that become pretty aggressive. And then they can also have echolalia or echopraxia, which is repetition. Echolalia means repetition of what you're saying or the other person says they repeat that in the same order before they answer the question or echopraxia is that they copy the gestures that you're making. So catatonia is not that common, but it does happen in this schizophrenia, but it can also happen in other neurodevelopmental disorders. We talked about the autism. It can happen in depressive episode or bipolar episode. Certain uh, medical conditions such as folate deficiency and immune disorder, um, they can also cause this, and it can be part of the paraneoplastic syndrome. So epidemiology, there is a 1% lifetime incidence of schizophrenia, which includes a schizophrenia form also. Uh, male to female is one-on-one. -on -one. There are three age of onset. Male, uh, male patients tend to start at an earlier age, 15 to 25, uh, and female actually start at 25 to 35. And when we look at the uh, prognosis, you will see that the men tend to have a worse prognosis versus female have better prognosis because it's a later onset. Then the second peak comes where incidence is fairly uh, equal, male and female is between 40 and 45. So those are the three on age of onset. Um, if you look at the presentation, it's so diverse and you can appreciate the heterogeneity of the underlying disease, which tells it that there's no one causative factor and there's not one part of the brain that is affected. The course is step letter, which means that um, every time there is a psychotic episode, patient, if recovers, it never regains the 100% pre-morbid functioning. There's always some decline into it. So idea is to limit the recurrence of those symptoms as much as you can to continue their functionality and the improvement in the condition. More frequency uh, of the recurrent episodes that they have, the worse the prognosis is. They also have a, what we call downward drift, that the patient starts with a higher functioning, uh, good family support, better lifestyle, and then because of the reason I just explained, um, the downward drift, they start losing their functionality, they lose their financial support, uh, and they tend to go into the lower socioeconomic groups and functioning, and that's called downward drift. Um, it's much more prevalent in the urban areas. Um, we have to be careful with the schizophrenic patients. Erroneously, they're considered to be aggressive, they're not. They're more prone to be uh, become the victim because of their presentation, their pro cognitive dysfunction, and delay in processing information. So the, in short, the schizophrenia is a neurodevelopmental disease with cognitive and motor impairment. Um, definite etiology is unknown, but there are different models that have been presented. Um, one of them is the biochemical neurotransmitter dysregulation that we'll talk about. There is anatomical changes in the ventricles. There is genetic component which tends to run in the family and the psychosocial stressors, um, environment, uh, various viral infections during pregnancy, all can influence that. The most vastly accepted is the dopamine metabolism hypothesis, where there is it's a very strange because the dopamine in certain areas of the brain is, is hyperactive and the other part is hypoactive. So if um, you look at the <coughs> mesocortical um, area of the brain, um, which I will show in the next slide, there's hyperactivity, which actually causes the 
the uh, positive symptoms, uh, such as hallucination and delusions, whereas in the prefrontal cortex, there is deficiency of the dopamine or hypoactivity that causes negative symptoms and mood symptoms. Um, and these are the three pathways is that we're talking about the ventral tegmental area going to nucleus accumbens. That's where the positive symptoms happen. If you look at, uh, and it is the increased dopaminergic activity from ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens. Now, mesocortical, on the other hand, is from ventral tegmental area to prefrontal cortex. That's our, our executive functioning centers. That's why you see delay in cognition and you also see the negative symptoms because the mood is also affected. And the third one, which is not directly involved with the schizophrenia, but it is involved in the potential side effect of antipsychotic medications that we use, and that is the, the nigrostriatal symptoms. So in substantia in Niagara, that's if the cell died in this area, it causes. Parkinson's disease. So if we give them the medication which blocks these cells in substantia nigra, it will produce the Parkinson-like symptoms. So that's important. This is, this is a good slide just to have an understanding of what would work where and how. So there are other theories that uh, serotonin is also implicated because of the affective component of um, the schizophrenia because these people also have the mood symptoms. So serotonin receptors can play a significant role into it. Uh, same thing if inhibitory neurotransmitters such as GABA, there's a destruction or loss of cells in that uh, in the hippocampus area there will be an unopposed overactivity of dopamine, which can cause positive symptoms, thus resulting in psychosis. Same thing happened with the glutamate, which is excitatory. So any substance like PCP or ketamine or LSD, they stimulate or mimic an, an agonistic effect onto those centers, and then they can cause psychosis by producing an overactivity of dopamine. These are things that you would see in clinical setting, eye movement dysfunction. Um, it is one of the most common uh, finding that is you can replicate actually in schizophrenic patients, also can do it in the high risk population, which are the first degree relatives of the schizophrenics. So they lose the, the smooth visual pursuit. And the, it's a simple test to do in the office, you can do it. And the patient will definitely exhibit that. There are about 70% that who would exhibit it. Now, they also have the impaired saccadic eye movement, uh, and that can also be done there. So important thing to remember is that the two types, one is the just the saccadic eye movement that you perform, and then there's memory-guided saccadic eye movement. The difference is the saccadic eye movement are more specific to the patients of the schizophrenia, whereas the memory-guided saccadic eye movement does happen in the schizophrenic, but it is very highly prevalent in the first degree relative, which we call as the high risk subjects <clears throat> of the, um, the patients, first degree relatives, they can be positive, even though they do not exhibit the symptoms of the schizophrenia, they can show an impaired memory guided psychotic eye movement. So that can be something to do in first degree relatives to, to make sure that you monitor them closely for any appearance of any psychiatric symptoms at the later stage of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. So neurocognitive symptoms that they do, that they have difficulty in processing the, the affects, the mood, and which I showed you into the, the mesolimbic system, that that's where the disturbance is happening in these people. Not all of them do it, but if they do, that will affect their mood. And obviously their attention will be disturbed and there is also impaired memory. So impaired nucleus 
accumbens which is involved in schizophrenia lies right next to the nucleus basilis, which is actually extensively involved in the patient with dementia. So that's why the, the schizophrenic symptoms mimic to that of dementia. And in the early ages, it used to be called as dementia precox, early stage or early onset dementia. These patients also, we talked about it, they have the impaired executive functioning, um, that they have delayed thought process, interpretation of that, their insight and judgment is also impaired, language functioning and social interaction. Sensory uh, centers, we did say that they have difficulty in appreciating the pain and they can be in that catatonic position for a long period of time. The risk factors for schizophrenia on the maternal side is that the birth that happens in winter months have a higher risk of schizophrenia. If the mother suffered from influenza during pregnancy or there were obstetric complications and there were major stresses in the mother, then they tend to have higher incidence of delivering a schizophrenic baby who eventually develops a schizophrenia. On the parental part, uh, paternal part, it's an advanced age of the father and the lack of a spousal support, which actually contributes to the maternal major stressors. So that is the paternal uh, contribution to it. These are the prognostic predictors. Um, the, let's start with the better one first. So the later that the illness starts, the better the onset, the more abrupt it is, and you remember we talked about the females start at a later age, so they have a better prognosis than the male do. And low socioeconomics tend to have a better prognosis. And it has been shown that it's more prevalent in urban areas. So people in urban areas with a higher socioeconomic group tend to do worse than those who come from rural areas and have a lower socioeconomic groups. And, uh, People that have more positive signs tend to have a better prognosis and schizoaffective disorder carries a better prognosis than the schizophrenia itself. Now, poor prognosis, on the other hand, is early onset. We talked about it. That's why the male are more. There's gradual onset. There's a family history, higher socioeconomic group, and the pre-morbid higher functioning. And if there is a structural brain damage, and they also develop more negative than positive symptoms. It's actually, and the longer the, the, the symptoms go untreated, the worse the prognosis is. So how many times would we suspect an adolescent um, of having a schizophrenia if they're isolating themselves, they're up all night, they don't take shower when they wake up in the morning, they're sleeping in the morning time, um, they become more defiant, show some irritability, they don't follow their parents. This is pretty common things that are observable in adolescents, particularly the same age where the schizophrenic symptoms are developing. And that's the reason that the schizophrenia can go undetected for a long period of time in these people before um, it becomes it comes to the parents' attention and they have concerns. Sometimes the school or the work report that their performance is declining. So how do we diagnose the schizophrenia? We have to, to get the pre-morbid functioning that actually predicts the prognosis. Then in the prodromal phase, usually can last from two to five years. I just explained why that happens, especially in the younger population. If they're already showing the traits of its, you know, cluster A, personality traits like a schizoid or schizotypal characteristic, they tend to develop schizophrenia more often. They have associated mood symptoms. And if there's any behavioral health changes, particularly social isolation and uh, neglect of self-care, and there is a decline in functioning, then obviously these are the things that you have to very critically look evaluate the patient, try to get that information from patient or from collateral sources like family members or friends or co-workers or school teachers. We do the SCID-5, which is the structured clinical interview for PSM-5. Um, 
thorough psychiatric history, substance history, medical history, and the risk assessment if they're danger to self or others at the time when you evaluated them. So those are the integral part of this kit five. Now, we also try to get collateral information, as I mentioned, from family, friends, coworkers, and, and school staff um, to, to complement and supplement of what the patient is presenting. A lot of time patients may not present or agree to those symptoms that's being reported because of the limited insight which is coming because of the impaired cognition. So then we can do different testing. Usually that happens once we start the treatment, but it can be used for initial evaluation and subsequent follow-ups, which are the AIMS and BPRS and PENS. <clears throat> I mentioned to you that uh, schizophrenic are more likely to be victimized than being aggressive and hostile. And that's because they have very slow responses, both motor and emotional. So by the time they get upset and agitated, the person who provoked that may have gone away. And by the time they start reacting to it, um, the target is already moved. So they don't usually become aggressive unless they're cornered. So, but they can be easily victimized, especially by the drug traffickers, because uh, these are easy target for them to sell the drugs to and then involve them in drug trafficking. Um, the comorbidities, which actually increases the risk. You remember we talked about uh, the risk assessment. That's what we need to, to look at that if they're using any substances, if there is a prior history of violence and there's neurological disorder, which may be causing disinhibition or obviously the antisocial personality disorder traits they had before the, all this started. Now, it's a very scary numbers that I'm gonna share with you is the 50% of people with schizophrenia will attempt suicide. And unfortunately, about 10 to 15% will commit suicide, will complete it. So it's a serious business. We have to be very careful in assessing these people for suicide risk. During your objective findings, you already collected the information from the psychiatric exam. In your objective findings, you need to look at the thought process because that's a symptom of the schizophrenia, uh, one of the criteria for that. And you then need to look at the contents and then the perceptual disturbance. Now, thought process can be circumstantial that they start talking about something and they start drifting from there. It can be tangential that they come, they touch, to the question that you talked about and then slide away. It can be loose association because the fragments may be completely unrelated if you put them to get together or they can answer any fragments which, which makes sense but if put together they don't have a flow. They could be thought blocking you. You're on uh, question number three after waiting a while but they're still talking about uh, and trying to answer the question number one. And the word salad is that they bring random words, throw it in, uh, mix them together, which does not make any sense. So those are the thought processes that you're particularly looking at. Now the contents of thought on the other hand, they can have delusions. They can feel that the people can read their mind and put thoughts in their mind, which is thought insertion. Thought broadcasting is where people, other people can read their mind. Um, then thought blocking, again, is we talked about that in thought process, but it can happen here as well. Now, ideas of preference is interesting. They would watch TV, and suddenly the characters in the TV have a different meaning for these people than actually what is exhibited or televised. And sometimes they feel that they're part of the drama, or they feel that the characters jumped out of the, the screen and they're intermingling with them or they're trying to control their mind. So those are, that is called ideas of preference. In neologism, I think I talked about it, that they create their own vocabulary, they start new words, which make no sense, don't belong to any language, and they're the peculiar symptoms. Now, hallucination, the most common for schizophrenic is the auditory. Visuals are more for the medical, tactile is more substance related, olfactory more epilepsy related particularly the temporal lobe epilepsy. 
Now, illusion, we talked about David Copperfield showing Las Vegas, but how about the schizophrenic if they start believing that the shadow they're seeing is actually a ghost or, or a devil which is following them? Now, that, now, they lost the touch of the reality. We did not lose touch to the reality while we were watching the magic, mag magician, but they did lose because they're believing now that this is the ghost which is following them. So the illusion can be part of the psychotic process. In effect, we talked about the, the, the negative symptoms. The effect can be blunted, it can be constricted, it can be restricted, it can be flat, or it can be totally inappropriate. Now, there are different categories that I, I don't think that scope of this lecture that I would explain more onto the thing of between blunt, restricted, and constricted. Um, it is more in a clinical setting that you see, um, but there are of different severity to the point that they completely lose it, which becomes flat and effect. Inappropriate is that you're talking about someone's death and they start laughing. Um, so they may have a fuller affect, but it is not appropriate to the content of the conversation. In cognition, again, um, you can have the impaired concentration, abstract, uh, you know, the abstract thinking can be uh, bleep. Uh, they tend to lose the abstract thinking and they start understanding things as the see or perceive. Uh, memory can be impaired, um, executive controls um, like judgment and insight can also be affected. Behavior uh, can be inappropriate, it can be disorganized, it can be bizarre or catatonic, or they may not show any, any behavior at all. They, they totally indifferent from the environment, which is amotivational. Um, or they show no interest in conversation or engaging with you. So that's, again, an hedonic. And obviously, they can be aggressive and violent, and you have to be very careful. Uh, protect the patient, protect the, the people around them, and protect yourself. So now we have to rule out the other causes of, of psychosis. Uh, certain neurological conditions can mimic with schizophrenia, such as strokes, seizures, Parkinson's disease of tumor. And it's also important to know those because certain medication actually can cause, then can decrease seizure threshold and can actually precipitate certain seizures which patient may be under control. And now you started some medication with the psychotic and the threshold goes down and they start seizing. Same thing with the Parkinson's disease. Most of them, they tend to have the extrapyramidal side effect and these symptoms can, can worsen. Uh, metabolic syndrome, hyponatremia, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroid, hyperthyroidism and diabetes, that can happen. Um, certain antidepressant, if you use it, uh, such as uh, certainly can actually cause hyponatremia, so it's important, or um, remeron, uh, mirtazapine, that also can do that. So it's important to not only rule out, to eliminate them as a causative factor of the disease itself, but also to monitor for the symptoms later on. Um, HIV and neurosyphilis can do that. Autoimmune disorders such as uh, SLE lupus can do it. And of course, the substances we talked about, the LSD and PCP, they can do it. We do the vital signs, regularly check them you have to do, because certain medication that I'll talk about can cause um, the metabolic syndrome. So that's why the CBC, CMP lipid profile, hemoglobin A1C, and EKG is, is essential to do at the baseline and then annually. Um, you do the drug screen to make sure the substance is not causing problem. Also women in childbearing age, you have to do the pregnancy test on them. Then you can do imaging, it's not an, it's not very common, but it can be done to rule out if there's a temporal lobe epilepsy uh, or if there's tumor in the brain or there's a bleed. So that can be done. So you are looking in schizophrenic, you can see enlarged ventricles. So that's the anatomical uh, the problems that um, anomaly that we talked about. And there's also reduced temporal lobe uh, 
mass, if you look at that, because um, uh, it was a mesolimbic system that passes through it, so that can be a factor. Um, PET spec and, um, and functional MRIs are not very common. They're still used just for educational purposes and research um, in studies. So, but there's hypofunctionality in the frontal lobe, which shows that that's doing, and there is a compensatory excessive um, metabolism in the occipital lobe. These are the things. This is the normal brain. Look at the size of the ventricles and look at the size of ventricles in schizophrenic. Same thing in the PET scan. The frontal lobe activity is decreased in the schizophrenic, and there's more in the in the cortex and uh, the motor cortex area. But if you look in the occipital, there's barely any in the normal uh, subject, but in the schizophrenic, there's increased activity. So these are the conditions that can co-occur with the schizophrenia, which is depression, anxiety, suicide. We talked about it, substance use. Almost 80% of the schizophrenic are chain smokers. Um, they get addicted to nicotine because there are multiple hypotheses, but one of them, which is more widely accepted, is that nicotine actually increases the release of dopamine in prefrontal cortex. That's where, if you remember, the patient was having negative symptoms and cognitive impairment. So it relieves some of those negative symptoms. They start feeling better because there's an increased activity of dopamine in that area. So what are we going to do? So if you look at the cost of treatment, especially in the developed world um, and the loss of productivity, it, it is more than all the cancers put together. So that's why it is important that we keep these people not only symptom free for themselves, but keep them functional for the purpose of society, keep them out of the hospital, treat them as an outpatient and provide them rehabilitation so they can continue to be a, a productive member of the society. We should develop a good therapeutic alliance, uh, discuss the short and long-term treatment plan with them, involve the family, also protect the patient now and make uh, prevent it from happening in future. Uh, Idea is to improve the quality of life, uh, reduce the relapse risk. You remember we talked about it, that there is scapular depression, so the more relapses that they have, the worse they will feel. So the lesser the relapses, the better the prognosis is. American Psychiatric Association have divided the acute phase, stabilization phase and stable. Um, uh, symptom onset to the baseline is about two months and baseline to remission, which is six months. And thereafter, it's, they're stable and they're, they work on the life goals. Uh, we can use psychopharmacology, psychotherapy, and psychosocial interventions, such as support group case management and rehabilitation programs. Um, the two major classes of antipsychotics, um, we have typical, which are mainly on D2 antagonistic in the ventral tegmental area uh, and nucleus accumbens. So they treat positive symptoms. These are the older medications that we talked about and they are not the, the target is specific. That's why they have a high incidence of extrapyramidal side effect versus the, the atypicals are more, uh, they work on not only D2 receptors, but they also work on serotonergic receptors. So they basically improve the, the negative symptoms as well in, in the prefrontal cortex that we were talking about. So they are more widely acceptable and they have a lesser affinity for the nigrostriatal system. So they have a lesser extrapyramidal side effect. And that is the only difference between typical versus atypical is the atypical has a less, far less incidence of extrapyramidal side effect. And the, as you can see that um, antipsychotic well, the typical one have been long used, but they cause extra pyramidal side effect. So higher potency, higher extra pyramidal side effect, lesser anticholinergic. Low potency, low extra pyramidal side effect, 
higher anticholinergic activity. So they're going to be far more sedative. So potency is the amount of dose of a drug required to produce a given effect, and efficacy is how much you need to use to bring the therapeutic effect. I've just thrown it in the bottom so that we can revise it very, very quickly. So first generation typical and uh, the conventional typical first generation antipsychotics are haloperidol, thorazine, uh, malaryl, prolexin. Uh, they're rarely used. 95% at least in the developed world is used are the second generations because of lesser side effect profile and also they work better for the effective symptoms. So they not only work on positive symptoms but also work on the negative symptoms as well. I've thrown the names in there. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I will just go through and you can look and read about them. I put some pearls together towards the end um, that might be helpful in your board exams or licensing exam if you're doing it. So KD studies book came out and it was sponsored by uh, the National Institute of Mental Health. So it was not a uh, pharmaceutical industry sponsored. So they clearly showed that there's no difference in efficacy of typical versus atypical antipsychotics. They're as effective as the other one, except that there is lesser incidence of extrapyramidal side effects in second generation antipsychotics, the newer medication. And olanzapine, which is the SGA, um, have sh also showed a lesser relapse rate. Um, QT, these are the common side effects that can happen and you have to be careful because it can be uh, fatal. Um, So with the typical antipsychotic, we have to be very careful about the QT interval uh, prolongation. Uh, they can also cause the hyperprolectinemia, so can lead to gynecomastia. Uh, it can actually cause lactation of the breast in male patient or in female patient that who are either not in nursing phase or are postmenopausal, and that is a scary finding. So be careful with that and. Um, uh, the reason for we talked about there are certain medications that we have to do the blood work on regular basis because of the uh, abnormal LFTs. A lot of time it is very transient. Um, people still use chlorpromazine, thorazine, and when they go in the sun, they get a really bad reaction to it. So we have to be careful about that. Um, I don't think we use malaryl anymore, but it causes retinitis pigmentosa. If you ever put anybody onto that, make sure that they have a thorough um, uh, ophthalmic examination by an ophthalmologist and then annual follow-up thereafter. Now, the most widely used atypical antipsychotic, there is a black box warning for these people because um, it can cause sudden death in an elderly patient who, with dementia. Um, Risperidone is very much like the typical anticholinergic. It has the most of the um, extrapyramidal side effect compared to all other second generation antipsychotics. Um, clozapine uh, and called clozaril and olanzapine, Zaprexa has the highest risk of metabolic syndrome, which is weight gain, diabetes mellitus, and or uh, hyperglycemia. Uh, and um, elevated blood, uh, blood pressure. These are the medication we cause QT prolongation. These are the newer, uh, the top two are the newer ones. So make sure you do a baseline EKG on these and then repeat every six to 12 months. This is the older one, uh, we talked about it. Um, these are the medicines which are pretty safe from the cardiotoxic standpoints, the Haldol, Risperdal, Zaprexa, Bilofi, and Clozapine. Um, 
I'll quickly go through the medication induced movement disorders. Um, the aims I showed you, the abnormal involuntary movement skill test must be done on patient on a regular basis, particularly when before you start the treatment or when you make the adjustment. And depending on the guidelines from three to six months thereafter. Um, as a rule, I always do it if they're just stable and they come every three months, I do the aims on these people just to make sure that they're not having any experimental side effect and not progressing to a second department cyst disease. Um, there are different categories. Acute dystonia happens right as soon as you give the medication and it's a spasm of usually neck, but it can happen in any part of the body. Acute ecclesia is it's an intense feeling of restlessness where a patient cannot sit and they get up and sit down, get up and sit down. And it can be annoying in the examination room, but we need to closely monitor and assess that, um, that it is truly a side effect of medication or it's just because the patient being uncooperative. Um, then Parkinsonism, second Parkinsonism, that can happen. Tardive means delayed dyskinesia is the movement disorder. So it usually happens over years. Um, tardive dyskinesia, and I'll explain to you more about it because that is, there's no treatment for it, so we have to be very careful. Now, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, it's a medical emergency, and I'll explain in the next slides. That's again the aims that I was talking about. Um, acute dystonia occurs very early in stage, um, more common in men. Uh, it's usually brief, prolonged contraction of muscle. You get them anticholinergic and it usually responds uh, uh, immediately. The, the scariest thing is called ocular guidic crisis in which the eyeball actually rolls upward and you only see the white in the eye. And it's a very scary feeling for the patient. They believe that they've gone blind and it's scary for the staff if they haven't seen it before or they're not prepared they can run away feeling that the patient may be possessed by a devil or something and, and it can look very bad. So when you get the call in the middle of the night and that happens, sometimes it takes me longer to calm my patient uh, by staff down than the patient themselves. And usually it also responds very quickly to the injectable anticholinergics. Yeah. Benzodiazepine can also be used because of the severe anxiety that is associated with that. Um, Acathesia treatment usually is the beta blockers or the benzos um, and try to cut back onto the antipsychotic or change the class. Secondly, Parkinson looks very much like Parkinson's spine tremors and rapid syndrome uh, is the, where the patient have the twitching of their upper and lower lips and, and it, it, they constantly keep doing it. So make sure that they didn't wear the dentures recently that can cause it. If that's not, that could be a sign of Parkinson's disease. Uh, tardive dyskinesia, it usually happens later in the life, depends on to the dosage of neuroleptic over a period of time. Um, and it's almost always irreversible. Uh, high risk are elderly diabetic patients, women in particular, and it usually is comorbid with mood disorders. Um, so look at the life expectancy. It's at 32% at five years, but again, it jumped twice as many at 25 years. So and it's, if the person is non-compliant, obviously when they have a psychotic break, you have to use higher titration dose. So that increases the quanti quant total um, quantity of the antipsychotic and they can have these symptoms. And again, there's, oops, so there's no effective treatment we talked about. It. Now, this is a medical emergency, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's a life-threatening. 10% uh, will eventually die, even if you have treated them. If they have to be admitted into the medical ICU. Um, muscle rigidity, severe dystonia, agitation. Sometimes they can even show the opisthotonus, to, as that happens in, in um, botulism. Um, and confusion, uh, altered level of consciousness, and high fever, sweating, high blood pressure, tachycardia. So you can see that the patient is very, very uncomfortable. We can use dantrolene, usually supportive treatment. Dantrolene uh, is used and that reverses the thing. Uh, 
synonym for the symptoms is fever, which is uh, for fever and subtlopathy, delirium, vital signs, autonomic instability, elevated CK, and rigidity. Uh, in severe cases in, or in urgent situation, we can even use ECT to, to break the cycle and bring them out of it so we can have uh, control the symptom more aggressively. The most sedating of antipsychotics are quinidine and clozapine. Um, most anticholinergic is clozapine. Uh, these are the pearls that are going to be helpful if you're preparing for your board exams. Um, usually they just throw these questions and you just have to memorize. And over a period of time, uh, when you're practicing, you will remember most of them. Uh, I, I'm almost out of time, so I'm not going to go over it, but we can quickly see uh, what's happening here. And pearls you can read at your leisure time. Clozapine is one of, it's rarely used. You have to fill three antipsychotics before it will be given. So uh, basically, there are a lot of questions in, in uh, board and licensing exam about clozapine. This is the medicine of interest there. Questions are easy to make. So these are the facts that you need to remember. And then I'm sure you'll be able to answer most of those questions. And the, the biggest one is the agranulocytosis. Uh, and myocarditis. It can also cause seizures, but that's once the dose goes over 600. Under 600, it's equal to this placebo. Um, orthostatic hypertension. One important thing to remember about is that there's hyperslivation during the night. Patient drools, but there's a dry mouth during the day. It's just the opposite effect. Again, it's the anticholinergic dysregulation. Very important thing to remember that this is one of the two medications that has documented evidence that it reduces the risk of suicide in psychiatric patients by 80%. So clozapine and lithium, which is a mood stabilizer, are the only two medications that actually decrease the risk of suicide. So if this medicine has so many side effects, so why do we use it? The reason is that once everything else is filled, the person has a very high risk of suicide, 9 to 15%, as we said, versus 0.02% dying of these complications. So you, if they have filled three antipsychotic groups, then you have to go and try this out. Um, we talked about these. Um, we have to get the family involved, look at the community services, um, supportive employment, improve their social skills. Um, they can be rehabilitated, work rehabilitation, self-help organization, and the CBT is also helpful in patients with schizophrenia. And so once again, thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed it. I hope that the things that I've provided to you is some help to you. And if you have any questions, my email address is right here. Uh, please write it down. Feel free to call me um, or send me an email. I tend to respond as quickly as I can. Um, and I'll be more than happy to help you or answer any questions that you may have. But once again, thank you for your attention. All the best. <laughs>